On the back of one of the largest patches Dauntless has ever had, and in honor of Dauntless going cross-platform and now being available for free on PC, Xbox, and PS4, we're going to be checking in on Dauntless in 2019 and talking about it. Talking about what has been changed and what's been added to the game over this last year, and then some of my own quick thoughts on the title. I should give a brief reintroduction or summary as to what Dauntless is. It's a free-to-play, co-op action RPG where you create your own character, you take that character on hunts to fight large, heavily stylized behemoths, using the broken parts and salvaged resources you earn from defeating these to create your own weapons, armor, and other items themed around the behemoths themselves. You use this stuff to take on harder challenges, stronger behemoths, and carve out different playstyles while trying to make some friends while you're at it. Dauntless is a game that really leans into co-op, and this release to console and being able to play and chat cross-platform is only going to strengthen that. I've been covering Dauntless since the beginning, I'm an official Dauntless partner, and this video has been sponsored by Dauntless. Links to check out the game will be found in the description, and if you're already an avid player, feel free to enter my creator code to help support the channel. So let's tackle the big portions of the game and their changes separately. Those being the behemoths, gear and items, and the game's structure and progression. And then we'll cap it all off with some smaller things and my thoughts. So behemoths are the names of the monsters in the game, and over the last year they've added four brand new behemoths to bring the total count up to 19. They also have added a new element type in Terra, which is earthy and nature based, to round out the elements of fire, frost, shock, umbral, and radiant. The new behemoths added over the year are the slippery shadow cat Riftstalker, who plays with the umbral element and drags you into the shadow realm and throws balls at you, and then on the flip side, and element, we have the hulking tank of a behemoth, Valamir, who doesn't move much, but this radiant behemoth brings with it quite the light show and bullet hell to do his fighting for him. Koshai, the Sovereign of Thorns, one of the behemoths slotted into this new Terra element, is themed around vines and overgrowth and brought with them a variable AI which is supposed to cause behemoths to fight differently in a fight depending on how you fight it. Most recently though is Boreas, who apart from loving some zebra print, this frost themed behemoth introduced slayers to encounters containing minions and has some really fun animations and my favorite weapon and armor skins in the game. On top of the new behemoths, we also saw many more dire variant releases. Dire behemoths being kind of like souped up versions of the normal behemoths. So Hellion versus Scorchstone Hellion, Pangar versus Frostback Pangar. They can have different sizes, colorations, moves, and especially in some of the more recent cases, the fights can play out much differently. It's hard to pinpoint how many are new because when Dauntless entered testing, they had these limited time islands where only a couple dire variants were available to fight each week, which another change, that's gone, it's all available all the time. But currently I think they've now released dire variants for all but three. And we've already seen teasers for an upcoming rework of the Scrave, which I imagine is part of their first content patch after this cross-platform release, and on their newly designed Dauntless roadmap, Blessed Tenuti, they clued us in on a bunch of upcoming stuff, but in that was the iconic Shrike getting a pass as well. So even though we may not have gotten as many behemoths as we want, they've been rounding out their game and been hard at work. Moving into gear, it should be mentioned that each behemoth brings with them their own unique weapons and armor with stats and traits inspired by the behemoth it comes from. They also have corresponding skill cells to expand the type of builds you can create, and they did away with having a low level and high level variant of this gear, so now there isn't a Hellion and Scorchstone Hellion set or piece of gear each. It's just a single piece with a long upgrade path this also came with a reorganization of not only the gear and crafting UI, but also of what appears on the gear itself. The stats, the traits, the cell slots, and it's all just been made way more intuitive and it fixed this issue where the cell slot type was the most important piece of the gear before, and now there's a lot more room to create builds. Cells themselves are now able to drop or are rewarded from hunts, so even just getting the right cells to make the builds you want has gotten better. Dauntless has a pretty interesting aesthetic, and some of the stuff available in the game, whether it's a full set of behemoth made gear, holiday or seasonal rewards, or even stuff that comes from the cosmetic cash shop, tend to look dope and contribute to the true endgame, dressing up your digital doll fashion. And in this case, Zanny rules supreme.
As for new gear or types of gear or weapons or items added, over the last year we've seen the addition of grenades, which function like grenades. We also saw the addition of the Ostian Repeaters, a set of dual wielded pistols that you mix and match parts to give it different elemental affinities and abilities and appearance really. This brings the weapon count up to 6, and over the year, while we may have wanted even more weapons, the ones we've gotten have received some pretty significant passes in terms of feel and ability and smoothness. Combat in general, and the playstyles derived from the different weapons, all have led the gameplay in Dauntless to be much more fast, more fluid, and quite a bit more over the top than where it started. It's as if they cast away the shackles that locked them into that grounded monster hunter feel, and over time has really just come into its own and embraced this like fighting game's soul as an influence. And I know that that seems off and a goofy thing to say, I could go on like a 10 minute rabbit hole to explain that, but I won't. It's just that the gameplay has a lot more juice now. One of the most exciting changes in terms of weapons and combat is unlocking the special of a weapon and giving you a weapon specific augment to gameplay. So in practice, this means that the sword currently has this default special of being able to power up temporarily, and during this time your sword slashes emit these aether projections and you have this really fun to use gap closing dash, well now if you want you can swap that out and instead you could have this iconic spinning whirlwind attack. The gameplay specific augment could be something like every attack out of a roll is an automatic critical hit, or while you have that default special powered up state, you can't be knocked down. This is a bigger change than it seems because it's adding a new knob to allow you to create different builds, and the more they add onto this, or the more creative things they add onto this, the more they'll differentiate how one sword player can play versus another. Some of these weapons have abilities that are supportive to the team, some have synergies to specific builds, and some are just fun. I can only imagine the things that some of the dauntless build makers are cooking up, and if I could recommend somebody, Revirad is one such dude you can check out for everything dauntless, he's got a YouTube and a Twitch channel, check him out. When it comes to the structure and progression systems in Dauntless, or how each part of the game interacts with itself, it has undergone large changes and tons of iteration. There are a few parts to this. You have the structure of how you move through the game that's changed. It used to be tied more to the selection of an island. And sure, there are still quests, but you've always just chosen the behemoths that correlate to the quests, and now there's just a list of behemoths, and they give them this relative threat or power level, and the only separation is, do you want to fight a random one, do you want to fight an element-specific one, or do you want to fight a specific behemoth? So it's just different organization of the structure, and the rewards and the currencies that you get from defeating the behemoths or doing a certain game mode. I mean, they've changed in name, but I don't even think it's that important to dig into the specifics. The core is still, if you want to build and upgrade gear from a Pangar, fight Pangars. And as you move through a gear's upgrade path and want to create stronger versions of that Pangar gear, then you need to fight stronger versions of that Pangar. There are, however, two core progression-based elements in Dauntless meant to direct players and drive retention, the Battle Pass and the Mastery System. So the Mastery System tracks and rewards you on a number of different metrics. There are what they like to call Mastery Cards for each weapon type and for each weapon of that type. There's also one for each type of behemoth. Here it tracks how much damage you've done with frost-based swords or umbral-based axes, how many times you've staggered a Nasher, how many behemoths you've slain with the repeaters, and as you complete or make progress in the listed challenges and objectives on these cards, you build up experience that builds up a mastery rank. There's an overall slayer rank as well that's comprised of all of the progress you make in all of the overall masteries, and as you level these up by completing these objectives, you unlock bonuses. These can range from increasing your maximum health, to increasing your elemental resistances, to unlocking a new sword special, or a title that shows you are the axe master. This is the new forever grind, and it would take all of the hours to fully cap this out, and it's built in a way, like a lot of Dauntless is, in that it's easy to add on to. They could easily add a new card for a new game mode, or for group functions, or guild functions, or solo challenges, or whatever. The battle pass, called the Hunt Pass in Dauntless, is exactly what you would imagine. 
For a limited time, your efforts in-game can unlock some interesting, mainly cosmetic rewards that are tied to a seasonal theme, and these rewards can range from emotes to flares to weapon and armor skins and much more. The current season has this Asian ninja style theme where last season was almost this Conan the Barbarian theme. I find that this is a really good fit for Dauntless and they seem to take these extra steps that make me a real fan. For one, they removed other forms of monetization to make room for this, which made me feel like they were trying to find the best fit for their game instead of double or triple dipping into the customer's pockets. There is a free track, but most of the goodies are going to come from the paid track. Two, they're not afraid to heavily, temporarily theme parts of the game to go along with this. So when it was a winter holiday, Ramsgate was full of snow, water was ice, a different season it was raining and murky and gray. For this new season, like I said, this ninja theme, we have these cherry blossoms and we're gathering kunai knives. The seasonal and holiday flair is something I've always appreciated in MMORPGs and it's nice to see it here. The types of seasons also show that they're willing to bend the aesthetics they allow in their game, and this is a win for fun. It might be a loss for immersion, but this is a gameplay first style title, and I don't think it hurts the game to have somebody dressed like a ninja standing next to somebody in a loincloth, standing next to somebody in a Christmas outfit. And I hope that this ends up going further and these seasonal hunt pass elements of the game become larger in scope and infect more of the game. Those are the big sexy changes, the stuff you'll notice but isn't what people want to know or will just be what they notice from seeing footage, redone menus and UI, voice chat, polished up animations, performance gains like crazy, revamps on matchmaking, FOV slider, sound upgrades, revamped website, redone character creator, the way the camera moves when you turn or the animation when you fall and land on the ground one-click gathering, just an uncountable amount of small things consistently added and tweaked so that a year later, it makes Dauntless ready for a release. When you look at the before and after, you can really see how far the game has come, and playing it, you feel it, it feels like a completely different game, and I was recommending you check this game out way back then, so imagine what I think now. Something that has kept me engaged in watching Dauntless develop is this rather unique delivery of content that they've done that's almost unafraid. You know, let me try to explain this. I follow and play a lot of in-development games, across them and released games. If one was going to like redo their interface menus like Dauntless has, most would wait until all the menus were fixed and release the whole shebang together. Dauntless, on the other hand, will add in one of their weekly or bi-weekly patches, which by the way, they've gotten really close to having no downtime updates, but they would release one menu screen that's been updated in a patch that might also have one buff icon added and one ability of one behemoth getting a sound effect redone. They also do things like getting an orchestral soundtrack recorded while still having placeholder art. They look into supporting RTX, they made the dog pettable, they have this razor mouse chroma effect, and just they react and create cool stuff and then want to see the feedback and adjust as well and as fast as a development team can adjust from feedback. But my assumption is that the culture of the studio is if you have something that moves the game forward in the direction they want to go and you can do so without compromising current goals or projects, I think they just get a green light. It, it certainly feels that way. It's some of the strangest and most endearing development I've seen that as you play it, you really do feel a slow but constant momentum and you notice new stuff all the time. It may not have the big juicy updates coming out regularly yet, but it's never felt like they were in a holding pattern, it's just that they were chipping away slowly making the game as a whole better. This console release is a great marker for the end of year one of Dauntless, which we could call a year of foundation building. They created a rough experience, spent a year tightening it up while also trying to maintain a player base wanting more and more. They grew a studio, they secured funding, they adapted to the shifting priorities of a live service and what that means in the current marketplace, and they've really ironed out their own identity and built and maintained a really positive relationship with their player base. I do want to say that the way that they handle their community and the way that they communicate with the community is some of the best I've seen in the industry. And by and large, the type of people who could enjoy this style of boss in a box, grind heavy action RPG have largely been positive about what they played. It's just that the game didn't feel complete or there just wasn't enough content so it couldn't hold your attention for a long amount of time. 
I hope that this year, year two of Dauntless, armed with new systems that do make the game feel whole and give you something to chase after, in addition to this console release probably being the biggest influx of interest and new faces into the game that they'll have for a while, I hope they capitalize on this momentum and year two is the year of content to keep people playing the game in the long term. Either way, check it out on the platform of your choice. It's free. Again, link in the description. Show some love by using the creator code FEVER. But that will do it for me. Until next time, peace.